right, so we've been working out problems involving the Hardy-Weinberg law. And so I want to show you one further type of problem that you might see on the AP exam. So we've talked about how you can get P and Q. P plus Q is equal to 1. This is always going to be true. P is going to be the frequency of the dominant allele, and Q is the frequency of the recessive, recessive allele. So this is on the formula sheet, and this will always be true. The other formula that we uh, discussed was that if a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared would be equal to 1. And we could use a shortcut. We could, since Q squared would be um, the frequency of individuals that are little b, little b, we could just take the square root of that to get Q, and then from there we could get P, and there was a, a whole process. So this is a third scenario. So we've got the scenario where they tell you that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and they give you some information, and then ask for other information. We've got a scenario where they tell you it's not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and you have to calculate P or Q, and you need to do it this, this longer way from the raw data. I showed you this in the first lecture. Um, but in this third scenario, they are actually asking you to decide if the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So this is uh, going to take information that we've already used, but apply it in a slightly different way. It's actually going to kind of put together everything that we've done. So step one, so they're giving us our raw data. This is how many individuals show each of the three genotypes. So they want you to get P and Q from, first thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to get that from the raw data. Because since we don't know if it's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or not, you can't just assume that, oh, if we take 5 over 85, that's going to be Q squared. That's only true if it's in a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And we can't make that assumption because they're telling us up front that we don't know if it's in a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or not. So the original way I showed you how to do this is that we would actually count up the alleles. So we're going to add up all the copies of big B over the total number of alleles, and that's going to give us P, and then we're going to add up all the copies of little b over the total number of alleles, and that's going to give us Q. So that's going to be 60 plus 50 over 170, and that's going to give us a P of 0 0.65. We actually worked this problem first, so if you go back to the other video, you'll see this problem. And then we can uh, use a shortcut here, since P plus Q equals 1, and that's always true. Um, 1 minus 0 0.65 will actually give us Q, so 0 0.35. So now we have our P and our Q. Uh, just a reminder, in case you didn't watch the other video, why am I using 170 down here? because this is the total number of alleles, and each individual, of which there are 85, each individual has two alleles, so we have to double that number. That's why this is 60 and not 30. There's 30 people that are big B, big B, but that means that those 30 people now have 60 copies of big B, because each person has two copies. So that's what we're doing. We're actually calculating by hand the allele frequencies by counting up how many big B's there are out of all the alleles and how many little B's. Okay, so we've got our P and our Q. Now, we know that if it is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and only if it's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we can use this shortcut because P squared will give us our frequency of big B, big B, 2PQ would be big B, little B, and Q squared would be little B, little B. But again, this is only going to be true if a population is in hardy one equilibrium. So I'm going to take my P and my Q, and I'm going to fill in what I would expect P squared, 2PQ, and Q squared to be if the population was in hardy one equilibrium. So P squared is going to be 0 0.42, 2PQ, 0 0.46, Q squared, 0 0.12. So now we've got our expected P squared 2PQ Q squared. Now, out of 85 individuals, we need to figure out how many individuals that would actually amount to. Because what we're ultimately going to do here is we're going to use a chi-square test. Remember the chi-square test. We've used it for genetics. 
We've used it for null hypotheses. A chi-square test will allow us to compare our actual data, our observed, to our expected to see if our observed is close enough to the expected to be acceptable. So how many would we expect to be big B, big B out of 85? You're going to do 85 times 0.42, because that would be the frequency of big B, big B if it's in hardy viper equilibrium. Now, I'm going to round these numbers. Since this is a number of individuals, we can't have 0.7 of an individual. You actually get 35.7 for this. So I'm going to round this up, 36. This is going to be 39. And this is going to be 10. So this is how many individuals I would expect to show homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive if the population is in hardy binder equilibrium. All right, so we're going to transfer that data to a chi-square table, which we've worked with before. So 36, 39, 10. Now we can clearly see the numbers are different. But we can't just look at the numbers and say, oh, it's not in equilibrium. Because remember, even if we expect, say, three-fourths of people to have brown eyes, let's say, that doesn't mean that out of 100 people, exactly 75 have to have brown eyes or we reject, right? Because we know that in real life, values may be off just by random chance. So what we're looking at in the chi-square test is, are our values close enough that it could just be random chance, that they're off by this much, but it's just a random thing. So remember, your chi-square formula would be provided. It's on the formula sheet. So you're going to plug in your numbers, observed minus expected squared over expected. I'm not going to work it out for all three, but I'll do it for this first one. So that would be 30 minus 36 squared over 36. Uh, and I usually round these to the nearest hundredths since the chi-square table they provide to you guys is to the hundreds. So I got one for that, 3.10 and 2.5 for this one. You tally those up, it's the sum of that, and this gives us our chi-square value. So our chi-square is actually 6.6. .6. Now this could just be the AP question. They could just ask you to calculate chi-square, and this could be a multiple choice question, um, which would be rather time consuming, but they have done things like that before. Uh, but it could also be a free response where they actually want you to accept or reject your hypothesis. You know, is this in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or not? So the next step, you get your chi-square, you would go to the table. Remember, we typically use, I didn't print out the table here, but we would normally use the p-value of 0.05. If you remember, there's a 0.05 and a 0.01 row. And then our degrees of freedom, there are three outcomes so the degrees of freedom, if you remember, is the number of outcomes minus one. So it would be two degrees of uh, freedom. So we'd use our 0.05 row, two degrees of freedom, and shortcut, I just went ahead and provided it to you. This would be our critical value. Remember, that is our cutoff number. So in this problem, our chi-square is greater than the critical value. What does that mean? That means this chi-square test fails. That means these numbers are off by too much that it's just random chance. And therefore, the answer to our original question, is this population in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Our conclusion would be no, because our expected values of what it should be are not close enough to the actual values to say that it's just a little bit of fluctuation due to random chance. So that is how you would solve a Hardy-Weinberg question where they want you to say using a chi-square test, whether a population is or is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium.